Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 437. Should be 437. Let me double check and make sure that's correct. It should be 437. Is it 437? Yes, it's 437. Welcome back. Hope you're doing well wherever you may be. If it's your first time checking out the show via YouTube, you know what to do. Make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, and leave me a comment down below. And of course, if you listen via the podcast app, a five star review, a share, and a download will go a long way to help spread the news. And all the other links, links to my social, links to the Patreon, can be found in the description. You know what to do. Click on them, get involved, get subscribed, do all that good stuff. Help your boy out. So, how's it going? Good, good, amazing. How am I? You know, same old. I'm sort of like this highlighter here, right? I'm ready to be used um, when needs be, but at the moment I'm pretty uh, useless for that, for lack of a better term, until the world reopens up again. But hey, we are where we are. We are where we are. So um, weekend stuff. What did I get up to? Not much really. Didn't move a square inch. Probably left my house what four or three times, mostly to get snacks. Um, for the rest of the time, I spent my time in bed watching various documentaries and movies. The most recent thing I watched, which I which I hadn't watched prior, was Braveheart. Uh, Mel Gibson. Uh, what is that? Is Magnus Opus, or do you say Passion? No, Passion of Christ probably is Magnus Opus, isn't it? Yeah, I, I'd imagine so. But Braveheart is pretty good. Again, I've never watched it in full. I think I've watched it in parts. I remember little lines, obviously, from memes and shit, but I watched the whole movie in full. Um, obviously, you know, in uh, in two parts. I watched kind of the first half one day and the second half the next, um, which is interesting. Going forward, I wonder if that's kind of, if that's going to be a thing going forward with people and, you know, um, movies and shit in general. Will that just be a situation where people will just find it way more difficult because they've been locked indoors for the best part of 18 months to just sit down and actually watch a movie? Or whether or not just go back to how it was before? I don't know. Who knows? But um, that movie was pretty decent. Um, what did it teach me? Braveheart. It taught me that we sometimes do, because the actual story of Braveheart isn't, of William Wallace, isn't as... Um, isn't as uh, movie ready as the actual movie adaptation is it's still amazing but it's a lot more tragic right in that you know he fought for the freedom of scotland and scotland is only quote-unquote free and independent what 23 years or so later so um he didn't none of his kind of direct ascendants uh not direct descendants he didn't even have any kids actually that's the other thing too so that whole thing in a movie where he impregnates the queen the princess to the queen to be and then she ends up putting a william wallace jr on the throne da, 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 da. that's romanticized that didn't actually happen but the sad thing about it or the kind of re the revealing and kind of sobering part of watching braveheart is just um similar to like when you watch the passion of christ the first time it's the idea that you know maybe i don't know what it is about humans why do we have this we have this strange thing where we sometimes feel as if we're the most important person in the world right you're kind of the star of your own movie always at all times so you sometimes can't comprehend or understand or even picture in your head how somebody could betray you you just don't think it could ever happen you just think for some reason you're this angel you're this perfect person everyone wants to be friends with that wants to be associated with and that could never happen to you but more likely than not greater people who have accomplished far more in their life have had you know have kind of gone through crushing episodes of being betrayed by some pe people that they counted as f family let alone friends and that was a revealing part of braveheart isn't it like in the end the people that he was legitimately fighting for were the ones that stabbed him in the back the ones that eventually got him hung drawn and quartered um and if you actually google or see google images of what hung drawn and quartering is you'll know that that is you know beyond beyond anything you can kind of picture nowadays with getting cancelled and stuff right that is legitimately you know probably one of the most harrowing executions i've ever seen in my entire life um and most of it of course it, it was kind of bound to happen in the end right um that was probably his only inevitable outcome from the you know from his uprising and resisting of the british rule of the english rule sorry it was either he was going to win or he was going to die there was no in between especially back then but to be offered up as a sort of sacrifice for the greater good quote unquote right um king of was it uh king of bruce or whatever that guy's name is um there was a grand division of like uniting scotland and you know pledging allegiance to the english throne so you sacrifice this one rebellious guy and kind of work with them but you know how it is and you can't ever trust these people they tell you they're gonna 
they're going to help you out they're going to sort you they're going to bring you in but in general if they're willing to you know kill one of your compatriots what's what's to stop them killing you so that was the one sobering part about it. i was like right it man like for all the amazing things you may think you've actually done for people legitimately if they you know whatever serves their best interest they'll just end up doing it. that's basically what it basically taught me whatever serves their best interest they will do no matter what it doesn't matter there's no excuses no if buts or maybes whatever suits their purpose or whatever suits their objective they'll end up doing and yeah um really good movie though all in all um i just think what it cost especially in 1995 imagine what it cost to film braveheart because a lot of it was filmed on location i'm assuming you know mel gibson's not the kind of he's not the green screen type of dude he doesn't strike me as that um you know when he's doing a movie like that he's going to do it right and do it proper um yeah that was a pretty incredible movie for in terms of just that illuminating factoid, which probably is a bit, you know, it's a bit like duh. Um, it's all like me finding out during this whole COVID thing that politicians don't really give a shit about us. It's like, where, where have you been living? But, you know, sometimes I can be naive. I think naivety is a good thing to keep in you. Um, what has happened? Oh, the most important thing happened, actually. Um, Man United uh, went away to Chelsea. Um, nil nil draw, pretty much um, as expected nothing to really write home about um quite possibly one of the dullest games of football i've watched in a while um more so in terms of us i guess um our approach coming into that game i kind of felt like we were kind of going for the draw we didn't really head you know wanted to win the game considering that we were what at the time i'm assuming we were nine points of it nine or six points ahead of chelsea i think i forgot what it was so it makes complete sense that um we'd probably want to make sure that we just don't lose as opposed to um, going in it to win and then end up getting trounced and then having the other, you know, Chelsea build up a bit of momentum, having the rest of the team see us losing, that gives them a bit of encouragement, blah, 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 blah. So the bigger, the grander scheme of things, considering what our goals are this season, which is probably to finish our top four, not a bad result. But as a game of football, it's um, it's always kind of, um, ref it's always uh, sobering. And it's always a bit of a reality check whenever I watch Man United because it's always a constant reminder for me anyway, personally, that we're just not, we're not what we used to be, right? We are, our objectives have changed. Um, our sporting, commercial, whatever they are, they've completely changed. Um, in years gone by, a performance like that wouldn't be tolerated because those sort of games are the ones that really make the difference in terms of you winning the title. You know, Silas Ferguson would always say, you know, you'd want to try your best to win those games of course if you've got a draw you've got a draw but the 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 kind of um what it sort of demonstrated by you going to a rival's home and beating them was that you were really you know you meant business right you were going to go for that title you were going to secure you know uh whatever promotion whatever it meant right that like, that's what it was all about and i guess nowadays with united it's definitely not that is it it's just more so about damage limitation and part of me thinks that early 6-1 loss that we would suffer to Tottenham beginning of the season, 6-1 at home against Spurs, which is a terrible result and something that we've kind of forgotten about because this year has just been so crazy with COVID, right? Um, we have like, what, two games a week, um, thick and fast, maximum of like four games uh, or four days rest in between for each team. It's just not enough time to kind of even process what's happening. I think in the regular season, it would have been so probably uh, stressed upon a little bit more, but we sort of just forgot about it really quickly. But that 6-1 loss at home against Spurs really kind of took the air out of our balloon and I think put a bit of fear in sort of Solskjaer's, um, um in front of Solskjaer. So much so that I think he's, cause before he'd always kind of say, you know, he's not worried about his job. He wants to make sure he may not succeed, but... Being a lifelong United fan as he is, having played for the club, being a legend, and then having your job being, you know, put under some kind of pressure during that time, um, it probably wasn't a good feeling. And, you know, once you're in that hot seat, you don't want to let it go, right? Once you get that bit of power, once you have that bit of influence, you're managing your legitimately the team that you support. And there's not a lot of football players actually even watch football nowadays, right? Most of them kind of fall out, fall out of love with the game. They play it just for the wage to go home. So for him to actually play for a team that he actually loves, especially considering his background and considering, you know, the fact that he didn't have the best of spell at Cardiff, went to Mulder, you know, in the Norwegian league. It's not really common to see somebody from the Norwegian league take over a club like United. You know, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. He's not going to let that go. So naturally, he's doing a bit of um, 
damage preservation or yeah damage preservation or damage limitation and ensuring that whenever we do face a top six side we just don't get embarrassed we might lose so again we might have lost this game one nil um we might have won one nil but he just doesn't want us to get embarrassed and i think that is all fair and good but you just want a bit more from united and you just want um you just want us to kind of show some intention that we're trying to be the best team in the league we're trying to be the best team in europe and that's just not where we're at and it's again it's i think it's so it's sobering because all the noise is coming out from the club social kind of you know speaks from both sides of his mouth one time he'll tell us oh we're not in it we're not going to win the league next time he'll tell us we're going to push man city to the end it's pretty confusing right i think by and large we should probably not listen to anything our manager has to say in the press conferences which is odd considering the history of managers that we've had who've kind of used the press conferences as a way to sort of galvanize the fan base send out a message but now with social we have to kind of ignore what he says but i think we just do um because the reality of it is we're second we're probably the best out of the rest but that isn't saying much because the rest are still in transition sorting stuff out right you look at the team and what they're basically doing you know, Tuchel's just arrived at Chelsea. Um, you know, um, if you count Spurs in it, Mourinho's going for a bad spell. Will they get a new coach? And we're not too sure. Arteta's not even in the conversation with Arsenal. Um, there's a lot of teams in there. Leicester kind of always fall by the wayside because they just don't have the level of quality of players to make up for their injuries. Liverpool are going for a situation and then Pep's just doing what he's doing with Man um, City. So there's a lot of extenuating circumstances around us being the best of the rest. Um, I still think given the players that we have, we probably should be challenging for the title. Whether or not we'd win it is another thing, considering the amount of resources and the fact that Man City just clearly have the better coach in the league. I think that's another conversation people don't want to have, really. But the fact of the matter is, you know, Pep Guardiola is the best coach in the league. He's not topped by, you know, coincidence. Yes, um, he has unlimited amounts of, you know, transfer funds that you can go to acquire players at Man City. But let's not make no mistake, Man City created their entire football club and structure built around, you know, Pep Guardiola being their coach. They knew well, you know, they knew, they identified the manager they wanted and kind of got him and made sure he had everything at his disposal to do a great job and so far he's done it. So maybe we're the best of the rest, but I don't think our coaching staff's the best of the rest. I don't think our manager's the best of the rest. I don't think we've got the best structure. But I think in terms of football on the pitch, we probably have the players to compete with a Man City and to probably finish cons consistently second or third in the league. It's just the difference maker really for me, I think would be having a better manager in there, a better coach who could bring out the best in kind of, you know, fringe players like the Bayes, like the Van der Beeks, even the Daniel Jameses, right? Just kind of develop them and kind of, you know, provide them with the opportunity and, and a way to play that can bring the best out of them. Similar to what Bielsa is doing at Leeds, right? Just taking, because, you know, I don't think there's any players in Leeds United fans would take for United, at United. Like, I don't think so. Um, maybe, maybe one, if anything, to be part of a member of the squad. But for the most part, and that might be Rafina, but for the most part, you know, these players are fairly average. But Bielsa has them playing to their max potential in a way because he's got a system that kind of brings out the best in them. And we just don't currently have that. We're sort of relying too heavily on Bruno and Rashford. And this was another game that sort of highlighted it. When Bruno and Rashford don't show up, we don't have any answers. And, you know, for as much as all the plaudits as Rashford gets and Bruno gets, sometimes I think, maybe not Rashford more so, because I do think he has a tendency to just pick up the ball and skip past seven people and just try and score a goal, right? But especially with Bruno, like especially with some of the comparisons with, with Eric Cantona, I'm like, I'm not too sure if this is correct. His all-round play isn't that great. His passing isn't the best. He's, you know, uh, controlling of the game, he doesn't really do that whole, like, you know, uh, taking ownership like the Dev Kevin De Bruyne style you know uh, Jack Grealish style where you, you just you try and basically drag your team through he doesn't really do that he kind of pulls up most of the time with clutch moments in terms of converting a penalty converting a free kick maybe scoring the old goal in free play but for them in open play so for the most part he kind of flatters to deceive and his record against the top six sides isn't the best either. So he doesn't perform and he's meant to be one of our leadership, uh, our leading figures in the team. Rashford obviously doesn't um, maybe pull up any trees, especially when he's not having having an off day. He doesn't seem to have an in-between. Either he's on fire or he's having an off day. And even when he has off day, he still manages to pull out a goal. So he wasn't able to do that. And then you just have nothing else left. You then you have, you know, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer clapping at Fred's miss when he kind of tries to curl in the top corner and it goes, you know, two two five yards yard and five yards five yards wide sorry and he's clapping it's like loser mentality but i don't know i don't know man um and then i guess the most um 
controversial moment of the entire game was this where I've got on screen now, which is the handball incident between Clan Hudson Odoi and Mason Greenwood. Personally, I don't think that's a handball, but by the letter of the law and according to the rules that we have now at the moment with penalties and shit, that probably should have been a handball, right? That probably should have been a handball. Any motion towards the ball in the box, usually the referee gives it. Now, I'm not a fan of it because usually it means even if you put your hands to your side and the kick player kicks the ball into the air and it happens to hit your hand as it goes in the box, it's usually given as a handball, which obviously isn't a handball. Um, but again, would this would we be angry and upset if it was given to Chelsea? Probably, yeah. No one would be that too pleased on the red half of Manchester if that was given to Chelsea. And then on the other side as well, the kind of, you know, the fallout from it from the press from the post match just shows just where we are as a club we kind of enjoyed the fact that we were given a ready-made excuse for this penalty incident you know um Shaw coming out saying that Maguire told him that the ref said um, if he gives the penalty he's going to get in a lot of hassle afterwards and then you know um, the club backtracking on that Maguire saying he didn't tell Shaw that he must have misheard uh, because I guess none the club doesn't want to be liable for any kind of punishment, fines, you know, court case, whatever it may be. And it's a complete shit show. And then Solskjaer does this really cringe, angry rant thing, complaining about some little uh, paragraph that was taken from a Chelsea website, talking about the amount of decision we get in the box. Just nonsense, really. Absolute nonsense, personally, for me. Things that just distract from what actually happened on the pitch. We didn't play well. We're not playing well. We played. We play conservative football with the players that we have. We don't have a system of system of play, and our manager is really not up for task. That's the basic manner of it. Like where we are at the moment is where we're always going to be at under Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. We can never get higher. And if we want to go back to winning the title, if we want to go back to winning or trying to compete in the Champions League, not winning, competing in the Champions League, qualifying at the group stages, we have to get a better coaching. It's just as simple as that. And with the better coach, you bring in a football director, you change the actual structure and the outlook of the club in terms of orientating it into a way that you want to actually win the big trophies and not just try and finish top four. And we might have a chance. But at the moment, only on social, I can charge. I don't think we have any. Um, I just don't think so. I just don't see it. Really don't. Again, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. Let me know in the comments down below if that's the case. If not, we just continue on. What else is next on here? I've got loads of other things to get through. Oh yeah, this is quite interesting, isn't it? Uh, a debate that you'd never think would be an un very unlikely debate. Let's just call that, right? So this is courtesy of BBC News. Um, LeBron James and Zlatan Ibrahimovic got into a bit of a back and forth um, regarding, I guess, athletes' place within the you know social and political discourse and whether or not you should use your platform to speak on these things in public. So it's the headline here. It says, LeBron v. Zatan, who won the politics bout? Um, it says the following, basketball superstar LeBron James has come out fighting after Swedish football legend Zatan Ibrahimovic told him to stay out of politics. Ibrahimovic said in a TV interview, sport figures like James should not get involved and it doesn't look good. James fired back saying, I would never shut up about things that are wrong. Pointing out Ibrahimovic's own complaints about racism in Sweden, James said, I'm kind of the wrong guy to actually go at. I do my homework. The two are mega stars in their respective sports. Ibrahimovic interviewed UEFA and Discovery Plus channel, criticised the political activism of sports stars do what you're good at he said do the do the category that you do i play football because i'm the best at playing football i'm not a politician if i've been in politics if i've been a politician i would be doing politics this is the first mistake famous people do when they become famous and come into a certain status for me it is better to avoid certain topics and do what you're doing best because otherwise it doesn't look good now obviously the comments are you know let's say they're obviously controversial nowadays just because for some reason we've given celebrities a very hallowed and lofty status in society, maybe especially in America, maybe because they don't have a royal family or anything. Um, they tend to kind of place celebrities on that same sort of level. Don't get me wrong, not only in the UK really listens to what the Queen has say, but you know, we have like we have we're a bit more um 
class driven i'd say maybe yeah we're, we're class and then status driven so just you know to get into the class conversation you have to be born into the right family blue blood all that shit that has its racial undertones and in the status argument of course money access wealth network all that stuff so people kind of know their position a lot more i feel in the uk as opposed to maybe the states i guess in the states you know the moment you become a millionaire or you become a billionaire you immediately involved or invited into certain rooms that you probably have no business being involved in and you get the you get the attention of people that you probably shouldn't have the attention of and you just have a lot more influence. It just feels like that anyway in America. It's a bit different here in the UK. That's what I'm saying. I, I just don't think, you know, I don't think anyone's listening to what Fredo has to say about, you know, knife crime violence in London, for instance. No one really cares, right? Um, it doesn't really matter in that respect. But I think in the US, it's opposite that way. I think the moment you decide to kind of speak about social issues, you suddenly use painted as that kind of guy, even though your past probably doesn't illustrate that. Now, in this sense, the funny thing about it is that it concerns LeBron James, who, in my opinion, is a bit of a hypocrite in this thing, because number one, I get his position, you know, his stance of like wanting to use his platform for good. But the reason the, 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 when he lost me was when that happened with the whole China incident, when obviously the NBA stars went over to China to go play. And there was this whole controversy around, you know, freedom of speech, certain games and video things were getting taken down. There was a whole Winnie the Pooh stuff. And obviously there was a treatment of the of the Uyghurs, I think you pronounce them, of the, of the Muslims in China too, in the concentration camps and stuff. And just really diabolical stuff that you'd imagine a lot of the more outspoken people in basketball um, regarding social issues will talk about. Because the thing with LeBron James that you can't really criticize him about, it's not always a black and white thing. He just talks about social issues in general so he's a pretty decent guy in that regard but when he kind of took the side of the you know ccp the chinese government in terms of staying out of the politics involved in china and then he tried to use his kind of discernment and rationality and saying hey i don't know anything about what's going on here probably more to it it kind of rubbed me the wrong way because that was part of the reason why a lot of people in the u.s again some of them had their own you know racial undertones regarding it it was a bit more kind of tinged around racism but for the most part most of the criticism that was kind of levied towards lebron james and from american you know talking heads and stuff was the fact that he was speaking about all these social issues going on but he was far from removed from it himself um of course he's set up initiatives with these kind of stuff you know to make sure he's kind of has his ear to the street but he's not living that life and hasn't been for the you know majority of his adult life um and there are things going on that he doesn't necessarily understand that kind of adding and abating the things that are going on in the hood in low economical issue uh, areas bloody blah, blah 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 so they were just asking him hey maybe you should maybe you know focus on other things instead of focusing on that and then he does the exactly the same thing when I forgot who it was as a coach for one of the uh, basketball teams said something critical or kind of, you know, put up support with people that were, I think, protesting in China during that time. I'm pretty sure it was the students that were protesting a new bill that was coming in or maybe it was, I forgot what it was, but he kind of put up support. And then LeBron James obviously um, criticized the guy and said he was kind of putting their lives in danger. I think he used that kind of AOC kind of terminology, right? He was being a little bit hyperbolic, a little bit over dramatic. They're kind of, you know, they're putting our lives in danger. We might die. We're the ones out here. He's not out here. Blah, 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 blah. Our safety, da, 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 da. But when, in fact, <clears throat> when you dug a bit deeper, you found out that LeBron James is, you know, a lot of his money is tied up in China. Um, if he came out and was critical of anything that's going on within the Chinese government, his deals would have got pulled immediately. And that's kind of billions of dollars. Again, no one's telling him he should do that and put it on the line. But it is a bit hypocritical to be picking and choosing the things that you're willing to stand up for when people are in pain. Right. When you find when, when you kind of want to be the guy that's sort of like standing up, sticking up for um, people that don't have a bigger voice as you, you would imagine that it would apply for everybody. It doesn't matter their color, skin, creed or who's backing them. You'd imagine you want to speak up and he didn't. He chose to kind of keep quiet, accept the money and keep it moving, which is fine. You show prerogative. But I also think <clears throat> what Zlatan said, although kind of maybe insensitive, wasn't wrong. Like, what are you like? what he said regarding the racism in Sweden wasn't necessarily a political thing, but more so a societal thing, right? I would imagine so. Obviously, there's some political, you know, there's politics involved in racism in general, blah, 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 I don't know what you mean, but in general, his treatment of how he got treated within the Swedish footballing setup, growing up in Sweden, you know, being an immigrant, uh, coming from a, is it, a Slavic background, right? I'm assuming with his, with his surname. It just probably made it difficult growing up in that country, by and large. And he did speak about it a couple of times, right? He spoke about it a few times quite in the open about the situation that he's gone through. 
but I don't think that doesn't that doesn't immediately uh, invalidate him saying to you, maybe you should concentrate on doing the thing that you know best because the thing that he knows best is obviously playing basketball because he's one of the best, if not the best in the world at doing that. So I don't know. I just find it really, really strange that you can't have a differing point of view on that. Like you can't necessarily look, because I'm sure there are some athletes out there that generally would rather do anything else but get involved in politics and societal issues. Not because they don't care, but because they generally think they can't make that much of a difference in the grand scheme of things. Like what has kneeling on a pitch actually done? What has wearing an armband? What has wearing a t-shirt actually done? If they can show me some demonstrable, you know, um, results as to those things that they've done, fair enough. But for the most part, they're all quite performative. They might bring attention to certain things, but in terms of actually providing um, respite, clear opportunities, um, you know, altering the future of people who are from, you know, these other disadvantaged areas, does that really change things? Or does it just, um, you know, highlight the nonsense that all these performative political stances do in, in in general like you know who's still putting up black squares on their social media profile on instagram feed who's still doing that what difference did that make zero for the most part you know so i i don't know i see where it's coming from it probably obviously looks bad when it's you know a white dude saying these sort of things it kind of optics wise it just doesn't look the best and considering how outspoken he was with his treatment in sweden but i just don't think he invalidates it personally it continues um Da, da, da. <clears throat> James' response after his LA Lakers beat Portland Trailblazers on Friday night was unequivocal. He said, I would never shut up about things that are wrong. I preach about my people and I preach about equality, social injustice, racism, systemic voter suppression, things that go in on our community. There is no way I would ever just stick to sports because I don't I understand how powerful this platform and my voice is. James also appeared to be confused at Brian statements that the football star has already allegedly spoken out about racism, allegedly regularly. He said James he said he's the guy who said in Sweden he was talking about the same things uh, because his last name wasn't traditionally Swedish last name he felt that there was some racism going on there when he was on the pitch um, so Ibrahimovic did indeed in 2018 tell the broadcaster Canal Plus um, that he did not receive the same treatment as other Swedish national athletes saying that it's about racism I don't say there is racism but I say that there is undercover racism um, he is similarly outspoken during a BBC interview in December, um, but he was also had to defend himself, particularly after other comments from Mario Carlton in the heat exchange in January. Uh, for his part, James has faced criticism for his political activism before. He clashed with President Donald Trump over the act of kneeling to protest systemic racism. Fox News journalist Laura Ingham told him to shut up and dribble. Of course, I don't agree that he should shut up and dribble. I think that was obviously a nonsense statement to put out there. Everyone should be free to do what they want. I just think it should be perfectly okay for people to, you know, speak about their um, reservations as to how uh, how much that actually affects things. What that actually does. Does it actually move the needle or is it just another performative thing that's just for the sake of it? It's for the moment it's ephemeral it lives there it lives in the moment and it kind of quickly disappears and it doesn't actually impact or change the lives of people that are kind of going through you know bouts of systemic racism things that probably james isn't going through day to day that's the issue regarding it isn't it really tell the tape da, 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 da. so yeah um interesting debate between the two people i think maybe it's more so um representative of the kind of cultural differences between people in north america and europe when it comes to dealing with stuff in politics and whatever it may be, I just think maybe I don't know what it is about us. Maybe it's because we have a lot more, like I said, classes, classes, some issues, um, probably that line up that are on the same level, if not supersede racism in some regards, right? I just think certain white people in this country, no matter how rich they get, will never be invited into certain rooms. It just exists as one of those kind of things, which is why people get really wound up with politics in this country because it just seems as if they're always kind of talking down to you. They never really kind of value your voice for the most part. Um, they're just speaking at you as opposed to kind of, you know, um, gleaning and kind of understanding your position and how they can best help. So maybe with that, there's this weird sort of general acceptance of where we are at and we just kind of focus on what we do best. Maybe that is, I don't know what it is, but I think there is definitely a general difference with how we approach societal issues when it comes to North American athletes and when it comes to um, European based, you know, uh, athletes, uh, you know, entertainers and whatnot. They don't really get involved. I, mean, I can't really think of many um, outside of, you know, the usual suspects like Carla and Co who are really kind of on the front line talking about things, bringing stuff up, going, you know, uh, debating, 
panel TV shows talking about serious, it doesn't really, I don't know, or even in the interviews, like when's the last time you've you've listened to Tion Wayne speak about, you know, uh, what's going, yeah, you know, I don't know, stuff like that. When's the last time you heard him in, during interview? I can't remember. Heady one, these kind of people, it doesn't really happen usually, but most of these US artists, with the exception of some, they always get, sp you know, they always get asked about the weekly event of, you know, police brutality that occurred in the States, um, what they think about this certain thing, this certain snub at this award, blah, 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 blah. They're always speaking about it. But in the UK, they kind of just leave you alone to do your thing, maybe because they know by and large no one wants to speak about it and because maybe you're not really going to make that much of a difference. Who knows? Who bloody knows? Let's move on. Let's move on. Let's move on. What else we got to talk about here? Oh yeah, <laughs> do you remember this? This was funny, isn't it? Do you remember? Do you remember there was a time when all we were focusing on was flipping chicken burgers? Do you remember when that was the situation? There was a time in life when the f the thing that people were concerned about the most on social media feed was chicken burgers, and I can't wait to get back to that. Honestly, I can't wait to get back to a time in life when we didn't focus about politics, we weren't reading the news. Um, we weren't sharing flipping COVID statistics and we we're just talking about who makes the best chicken bloody sandwich, right? As trivial and as nonsensical as it may be, isn't that a far better life to live in or a far better world to live in? Generally, I honestly think that. I don't think many people should be concerning themselves with stuff like politics in general. I think that you could be, you know, your time could be best spent doing far more important and meaningful things then focusing on what's going on and flipping you know the house of commons and shit doesn't really impact you day to day it does but it doesn't really you know um and yeah maybe chicken burgers <laughs> impact you mostly who knows you cover a good chicken burger you share it you might gain you know a couple of hundred followers on your social media feed you might get a couple of reshares on or on the story or on the ig right it actually will actually impact you in a good way people will actually know you gain notoriety off the back of it Oh, mate, honestly, man. Uh, what can you do? What can you do? What else do we have here? Oh, we have this. This is pretty fun. Someone created this um, little counter one page website called One Way, one way, one way Road to Beer, which is effectively a little countdown site that sort of rounds up the, you know, every sort of hour, minute, day that's going by when we can kind of different stages of when people in the UK are going to be able to, you know, enjoy a pint with friends in a social setting. Because as you guys know, with COVID, lockdown, you know, we've been prevented from doing that for a few months now. So the kind of light at the end of the tunnel is kind of giving people a lot of hope. And it's great to see, you know, this sort of thing wouldn't have been created a few months ago because people are still, you know, kind of down in the dumps, not really knowing when the, you know, when they were going to see them, when they, when they were going to return to some semblance of normality. But with the good news last week, with the roadmap that's been announced, things are starting to look up a bit. And these sort of things kind of give you hope. So the first square here, we've got being in the park with one friend. We've got a timer here counting down to when that can occur. We've got here on the right, beer in the park, 27 days to go to that. Um, down here, which you can't see, says beer in the garden with five friends, 41 days. Beer in the pub with five friends um 67 and then beer everywhere with everyone 111 days to go absolutely crazy so i'm assuming as they keep as it kind of hits the marker one will disappear until we get to a point where one will just be on the entire screen pretty cool isn't it honestly really amazing to see i recommend you check it out one way road to beer get it saved on your bookmarks keep reminding yourself that you know especially if you're down in the dumps and you're feeling a little bit down and you want to give yourself a little bit of something to look forward to definitely check out that site man it's super super handy next we have courtesy of sasha lord the legend that is sasha lord he's really been doing the lord's work man he's definitely doing the lord's work in terms of um sticking up and standing up for the hospitality industry by and large um and yeah man like he was kind of initially from what i can understand this is courtesy of a tweet he shared he said today i can announce that the government dropped a substantial meal requirement in the recent roadmap as a result of our court case judges in our case ruled that the measures are was arguably uh, discri discriminatory towards certain sectors of society this is a landmark future of hospitality so if you remember prior there wasn't a, there was this whole thing when we were kind of getting out of lockdown we had this whole tier system where the uk government was basically pushing for a um 
implementing this thing where pubs and restaurants were required to serve a meal if they wanted to serve an alcoholic beverage. Now, I guess the thinking behind it, as nonsensical as it was, was that if you have to serve food, it means that people don't need to stay as long, right, if they're just drinking. Um, but then, of course, with the serving of food requirement, it immediately sort of reduce the amount of places that could offer it because you know i think from what sasha lord says um the majority of pubs and bars in the uk don't offer any sort of substantial food right they're mostly just you know traditional pubs that serve drinks so um this completely discriminates from a whole bunch of pubs who happen to be uh based in areas that are already suffering economically financially and these places are the only places um or you know um businesses that these people can actually make money from so to kind of cut them you know beneath their legs you know especially during this crazy times of living in was was, was really really bad so he went hell to bat for them really fought for it so much so he got to the point where he can again he's happy to announce that that will happen uh, now going forward there will be no need for any sort of uh, substantial meal uh, going forward and then the other thing that was really interesting news with the roadmap something he's been to implement was this final tweet where he says finally i can confirm my legal team and i are now discussing regarding the lack of evidence to justify the delay of reopening hospitality compared with non-essential retail which is amazing so i think as the roadmap specifies uh non-essential retail opens before pubs and bars so you will be only allowed to drink outdoors but then retail shops will be open so the kind of thinking that he's basically having is that why can you go to the supermarket why can you go to the you know retail store a like uniqlo or h&m whatever it may be called but you can't have and enjoy a beer with your friend or sit inside a i think he made the example on talk radio earlier you can't sit inside a print and have a sandwich it doesn't necessarily make any sense if it's one rule um it should be one rule for everyone not one rule for some and again like i think considering the numbers that we saw last year about you know the lack of actual spread within the hospitality industry of the virus it does go to show it does kind of really make you question what the real science was behind a lot of these um a lot of these uh, restrictions that got put in place in the first place most of it obviously came from fear i'm assuming especially in the early months no one really knew what was going on. We didn't really have much information. We didn't really have a lot of data points. We didn't really have a lot of experience. But now that we've kind of, you know, been living with this virus for, let's say, a year already, um, especially if you, if you think about the first reported case, I think was sometime around November, if I'm not mistaken. But, you know, the world started to change around February because I remember that's when I came back from Berlin. And then from then, you know, things started to kind of slowly get closed down all across Europe as the kind of virus spread from Southeast Asia. We have a lot more experience. We have a lot more knowledge. We don't need to be in a position where we're just sort of like draconianly sort of like closing stuff down willy nilly just because we're afraid of, of any sort of spread. Let's look at the data. Let's look at the numbers. If the numbers don't kind of lend themselves to closing various sectors of the industry, of the, you know, of society in general, let's keep them open because, again, it saves the government money too. Do you know what I mean? Like most of these places aren't going to be able to survive off of government you know subsidies or benefits or grants for the foreseeable future a lot of places have kind of unfortunately gone for good so if you want to keep you know whatever we have available um or we, whatever we have standing still around when the world reopens up again the best way to do it is to let people go about their regular lives and open up as per normal of course if it's safe of course if it's safe what else do we have here Oh yeah, cool. We have this. Let's check this out. Let's move here. Let's check this off the screen. I shall share that on the live stream later. I think. Let's get that off there. Let's go here. Yep, yeah, this is cool. This is courtesy of Variety Magazine. So, I think I mentioned earlier. This was, must have been what this probably could have been a few months ago i'm assuming this was june i'm gonna say june of last year there was an article i shared um quite often on the podcast about uh one of the people involved with coachella or something right saying in june 2020 that he most likely didn't think live events would return again until june 2022 right and at the time it sounded flipping insane but of course as time went on as the virus spread more variants you know were found in different places it was like jesus that guy was right he was like a savant this was before he had any knowledge of a, of a vaccine you know being you know fast tracked uh through to approval and us being in position that we're in now so he kind of called it 
but obviously since the vaccine has kind of got rolled out especially in the uk things have just changed overnight prospects you know various industries and just the overall tone and feel of the entire country has completely changed and this is kind of credit and this is kind of lines up to it and this is courtesy of variety the headline reads live nation ceo says u.s music festivals could reopen by midsummer um, as you know already in the uk we have a timeline that effectively allows festivals to reopen if i'm not mistaken from june onwards there's been a, there'll be a possibility for festivals to go back to normal quote unquote without any need of a reduced capacity maybe obviously some you know some standard safety protocols and health and safety things but there'll be no need to do anything right out of the ordinary if we continue with the vaccinations as we are at the moment and just reopen as per and this kind of article sort of um explains why that is uh so continue just read a bit over here live nation has taken a timeline provided by the british government as an all clear for the summer festival season <coughs> sorry about that um selling some one hundred and seventy thousand. 170,000 yeah, 170, tickets this week to three UK major festivals that were put on sale this week. Um, and according to the comments made around the company's grim 2020 earnings report on Thursday, it's optimistic that North America can be on a similar pace. On Monday, the British government set out a timeline that states that large music events in the UK can resume at 100% capacity beginning June 21st, effectively the start of this lucrative summer season. Shortly afterward, Live Nation put up 100,000 tickets for its Reading and Leeds Festival scheduled for the 27th and the 29th of August, all of which sold out uh, by late in the week, according to the music business worldwide. The company also put up tickets to dance music based Creamfields events taking place in August 26th and 29th on the sale this week as well announcing that the event was sold out 70,000 tickets in 48 hours record breaking time which is obviously can make complete sense right the this is kind of the general reaction everyone assumed in the entertainment industry especially considering that we were kind of in an extended lockdown I think if this would have happened maybe sometime last year I don't think the demand would have been as strong but because we spent a, an extended period of time locked down people's desire to go back outdoors to see strangers to touch faces to dance amongst people has just grown right the appetite has just grown and i think some people it's probably um outside of the people that are interested in it i'm assuming a lot of people that are going to these events some of them might be their actual first rave or their first festival they just want to be outdoors kind of change up um, their scenery completely during the summer times and the great thing about this is that of course it allows festivals and things to reopen at 100 percent capacity but it's also great because it just shows how much we've kind of how far things have developed and grown in the last few months isn't it like who would have imagined this would be our scenario this would be our reality especially in the uk you know just even you know the beginning of december when there was that conversation around a five-day break for christmas and shit who could have imagined we'll be in a position where we could be seeing ourselves in festivals in the field somewhere covered in mud you know people's you know dilated about to go to a festival who would have assumed that could happen it's absolutely incredible to see and again a real turn up for the books because i said myself i made a prediction that i most likely thought we were only going to be back between what 2022 as well i said early 2022 i'd assumed that would be the date or they might kind of squeeze it before the end of the year just to give people a chance to kind of celebrate the new year in a kind of positive light i thought that might be a thing but to be in a situation where legitimately we could be what going back to carnival this year or something as well just summer it's insane it continues here. Live Nation CEO Michael Rapino trumpeted these statistics on companies earning call on late um, call on late Thursday, um, which cumulatively balanced understandably disastrous financial results for 2020 with a soaring stock price. It's considerably higher than it was last year um, and on verge opposite for the future. Asked during a call about when the large scale events might resume, he said, Every day we seem to have a new state or country talking about when they'll reopen. So we're feeling very optimistic that we're going to where we'll be a month ago. Lots of artists are calling, uh, looking at how they'll start things up in July, August, September. So for right now, we still believe that we'll have, uh, we'll have enough to open the UK, Australia, China, sorry, Canada, and US to keep what we have on the books in the amphitheaters booked for now. We might have. Uh, we might have we might have certain states that might not be ready but we have enough states enough artists willing to play the open slots if we get that level and in the right market of course do you, is do you think there's an artist out there at the moment that exists that will turn down a free slot to go play at some of these festivals especially after spending this prolonged period of time indoors not doing what you know or love best come on 
they're going to be chomping at a bit clawing at the door of these promoters trying to get themselves on it and you know rightly so it continues so um, so as long as these states open up in the right capacities he concluded we can sit there midsummer and in the southern u.s we can go all the way into november uh, probably miami florida is probably a good place to go with that one uh rapino implicitly um noted that things would not not as clear in the u.s not clear clear cut in the u.s where no similar timeline has been set by the federal government and such decisions may be under jurisdiction jurisdiction of states or even countries he said we think we're better off uh, waiting for a high bar capacity moment in most of these states to ramp up and to talk artists about getting paid properly um said rapino adding that the prospect of 75 plus capacity could have reopened in large US markets was within sight yeah that makes sense because i think if you're a bigger artist playing a small capacity venue or reduced capacity just isn't worth your time um the promoter or the event organizer probably can't justify paying your full rate you can't justify charging the full amount and you're not also guaranteed to have everyone attend because the virus is still looming whereas the sentiment completely with punters um will completely change if we're sort of at a 75 percent um capacity level because that'll mean that most likely the you know most of the population has been vaccinated or you know herd immunity has been achieved through some you know measure whatever it may be but it gives you a far better option a far better way of maybe recouping your monies especially if you're a bigger artist or even just smaller artists it's probably just worth more to have 75 percent of the capacity as opposed to under it just doesn't make any sense even if you're playing in a bar um live nation made a bold statement in the confidence earlier this year early this month sorry by placing rescheduled tickets of weekend after hours tour which was originally scheduled to launch in may then moved several months later and now scheduled to begin in january 2022 on sale with several dates um dozen days added so that weekend tour and i was not looking that dumb in it remember everyone was fucking going crazy about the weekend announcing his tour but it's looking really optimistic going forward man and i can't wait i honestly honestly can't wait and then obviously to make it um make it real Places like Gala, this little festival that they do in, I think, is it, is it Peckham? Or is it Lewisham? It's Peckham. Peckham, right? They announced their lineup too. So they're, they're on board too. It says it Gala 2021. Uh, announced for the 31st to the 1st of August. Um, the lineup is pretty decent as well. It's a little bit of a hipster lineup, don't get me wrong. But still a very solid lineup and a good indication that things are returning to some semblance of normality. Um, you have Bradley Zero, CCC Disco, Coco Maria, who I'm a big fan of, um, Gerd Jansen of Suda Alive, Horsemeat Disco, I've seen a bunch of times, Job Jobs, uh, Job Jobsy, sorry, the Dutch DJ, MCDE, who now goes by Mosey John or something. That's what he goes by now, and I think he got shamed out of using the full name in it, in its full essence in Mosey John Ensemble by uh, techno twitter a lot in it they probably shamed him out of using that <laughs> reparations and shit um move d luke solomon back to back with gideon robin flugel shy one playing gang gang uh giles peterson of course eliza rose like that's a stacked lineup but that's already been confirmed tickets i think are going out i'm sh- is it next week or something like that i think it's next week should be next week or something but yeah Good sign, man. Good sign that life, normal life is resuming in some semblance going forward. Let's see. Was it next week or is it coming up? I remember seeing there's going to be tickets announced. When is it? The, 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 no real idea. There's a say tickets. When does it say? Tickets going to sell on the 4th of March. So definitely check that out. Gala going forward. And then to make matters even realer, if you weren't um, on board before, you definitely be on board now. The faith anniversary of Brian Pride will also go ahead in August. So that means more more than likely, um, we're probably going to have carnival going forward. I think from the last I read, the carnival organizers said they're basically going forward with organizing things as per normal. They haven't really changed anything. So that probably means that they're expecting it to go forward. And I can't imagine a world, which again, the UK government, you know, they're, they're always full of surprises. But if they could imagine they decided to just... Um, let Brian Pride go ahead, but then tell, you know, tell us people, <laughs> as you can see, <laughs> that we can't go carnival. That would be hilarious. The, the, the flipping backlash would be insane. Imagine that. Um, but yes, it's the 30th anniversary of Pride is going forward in Brighton from August. So yeah, man, good signs going ahead, man. Optimistic. Life is looking good for us over here. Pa, 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 pa. Okay, what else we got here? What else we got here? Let's move on, move on. 
Oh yeah, this is courtesy of BBC News. So this, um, I've spoken about this in detail. This is courtesy of BBC News. Put this by us in detail via my Patreon. So if you want to hear more of my unfiltered opinion regarding the RNS debacle, um, this is courtesy of BBC, Dance Label RNS Records, accused of racial discrimination. I went into it to a bit more detail, giving you my unfiltered opinion via Patreon. So if you want to hear all of that, make sure you click the link down below at patreon.com for just Agostino, patreon.com for just Agostino. I'll be uploading bonus shows on there all week, all month, all year. So make sure you just keep checking on there. You can subscribe for a little as one dollar, little as one pound on there. So get involved. But essentially, um, I'll give you the synopsis of it uh via this paragraph here um it continues it said the head of influential dance music label RNS records discriminated against black and female artists according to a former employee labor founder renat van der Pep papillary dismissed music by some ethnic minority artists as quote-unquote meaningless and claimed that the history of techno was quote-unquote very white and said the former talent scout raj chowdhury chowdhury is suing rns for unfair dismissal citing racial discrimination the label said that there was no truth to the spurious and damaging claims quote Mr. Renat van der Peplieri is certainly not racist and everyone at RNS Records embraces equality, said RNS co-founder Sabine Mays, who is also Mr. Van der Peplieri's wife in a statement. Um, imagine if you could just get your missus to write statements for you, denying anything that you do, and we're meant to take that and believe it. Like, come on. The statement characterized Mr. Chowdhury as a freelancer who became disgruntled and accused him of trying to blackmail the label for 10000 Imagine people just describing you. Imagine all the work you do for a label and they just dismiss you as a freelancer and say, <laughs> you're just trying to blackmail him out of money oh god um there's simply no truth in anything he says it added this is course this is the thing launched in belgium in 1984 rns records has released some of the most seminal tracks in electronic music from john beltram's energy far energy flash to fx to in selected ambient works 85 to 92 in employment tribunal papers and filed in london mr chowdhury said that he had repeatedly attempted to diversify the label and the artists it worked with but found his efforts were frustrated or criticized some of the bam which i hate that term bame imagine like oh yeah this I hate it. Some of the BAME artists um, uh, a champion were dismissed as terrible and crap, according to text messages included in his claim. Um, just imagine this guy telling you your records are crap. He looks like he can't even dance, can't two-step, probably can't, you know, uh, probably can't whistle. You know what I mean? Like, sometimes uh, people people put themselves in situations that they just don't need to be in. Um, Mr. Chowdhury also alleged that Mr. Van, Van der Peplieri refused to sever ties with a record artist who replaced anti-Semitic messages on Facebook. One post contained a photograph of Hitler captioned, you should have listened. <laughs> <laughs> quote remove his track no way said wrote mr van der Peperi after being made aware of the message he said inform him of the danger yes when mr chowdry continued to express his unease over the associated with the, the associated with the artist he was told to quote unquote relax a bit jesus christ the gaslighting toxic king it continued mr chowdry has also alleged that rns tried to suppress the nhs charity album that he had put together because in his opinion mr van Perry was uncomfortable with the black and non-binary music features under compilation his tribunal papers included an email investor per mr van der Perry, in which he said time to delete the nhs compilation and time for quality i know raj you love all this but i hate it no talent no quality so essentially you know you know the whole just of it raj who worked there as an a and r it looks like is alleging that the head of rns records wasn't very open or willing to kind of uh co-sign or green light any of the work that he was per he was presenting and pointing forward to rns records because in raj's opinion it happened to kind of present or focus in on a particular uh group of people who you thought were under who un what, what was that word called um, who weren't given the platform or unrecognized, whatever that word is, right? Obviously, there probably is a racial undertone to it. I'm not going to disagree with it, right? This guy's from Belgium. If you know the history of Belgium within DR Congo, you'll know that, you know, some of the white dudes over there are a bit sketchy. But there's also a plain fact of the matter is that this guy is old as fuck, right? He most probably has has had these opinions um, for a very long time. And people have been willing and ready to work with him because obviously he's founded one of the most legendary labels in dance music, right? So there's clout and there is obviously exposure 
and network and access that comes to being associated with RNS. So much so that people are willing to put aside the um, uncomfortable truth that this guy might be a closed racist. He might be a xenophobe. Uh, he might be a bigot. He might be a loads of things. But people are willing to put it to one side because he's provide, he's kind of created such a great platform that you know if you put out a record a compilation or you're associated with that label it can really open up some doors for you and change the entire course of your career that's a deal with the devil that people are willing to do in my opinion i don't think anyone should do that i think especially in the electronic music world especially with the access and the you know the technology that we have available um there is no excuse for anybody to just be willing to put up with this sort of treatment instead you should be going out there and trying to invest your money in yourself building up your own thing and doing it the way you want to do it ultimately even taking away the racial undertones and the you know the kind of insulting way that he's kind of dealt with his employee if he generally thinks that the work doesn't mesh with what he vision with what he has with his label that's his own prerogative it's his label he found it he can do what the hell he wants to do um it might not be great it might not be something that kind of speaks to the times that we're living in at the moment representative of the scene but again similar to club nights similar to when you want to become a dj especially in my, in my experience most of the time no one wants to give you any sort of shine because they're all focusing on themselves you try and hit up promoters and clubs are going play places they already have the network of people that they want to go um they they kind of trust and they believe in so the best option for you to do to kind of get involved is usually to either you know volunteer and try and help these people that are doing things in the scene that you like and just kind of be around in the scene or is to kind of put your money where your mouth is and do your own club night it's risky you have to you know maybe hire the venue uh book security um hire security guards uh pick a door have a door picker come down one of your friends you got a slip of 50 put together a lineup create the artwork for the flyer promote it and market it on social media hand out flyers in general and face to face it's a lot of work but in general if you want to get your foot into the industry you want to get your foot in you want to allow yourself the opportunity to play you know the music that you love in a great place duh, 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 duh. you have to kind of you know have some skin in the game you just have to it is what it is um the other option is way more harder way more difficult is to kind of go through the traditional way i don't know hit up places record mixes just it just doesn't make any sense because there's so much competition you're better off kind of carving out your own little lane and hoping people come to you that way so part of me just thinks like if you're raj and you've got that experience again if i'm not if i'm not if i'm not, if I'm not mistaken raj raj is definitely one of the guys that was involved with living proof which was one of the more popular hip-hop nights that we had in the uk um and they did some really great things when they were really going right i'm not sure if they're still, still doing it now i haven't been in years but at the time they were hot shit he had loads of connections loads of access i'm not sure even not all of it came from ironist but he could have easily parlayed that thing into his own little situation and especially if you read the entire article it st stipulates that he was getting paid a thousand pounds a month to work as an rna so to work as an a and r sorry rns records that's pins that's a peanuts for somebody especially of his stature who i'd imagine is very passionate about his job he's definitely not clocking in and clocking out you're definitely working around the clock doing what you love putting your blood sweat and tears into things he's imagine he's working a job like that you could easily just you know phone it in and just do the bare minimum but he's not he's trying to kind of uplift his friends that are kind of from unrepresented unrepresented um backgrounds giving them a platform as well obviously he kind of got met with a stiff arm but he tried to do the great the, the good thing so why not take that kind of work ethic right that drive and that mentality and put it into your own stuff why would you kind of put it on a platform with a guy who clearly has some very questionable views on race, on 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 society in general, on artistry? Like he clearly has some issues going on there. It's his prerogative, though, isn't it? I, I just don't see the, I just don't see this whole like um policing of how people run their own business is it bigoted is it offensive is it rude yes 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 tick 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 but again in this world with soundcloud with the tune core with all these platforms and you know uh plug and play flipping um systems that you can set up in your computer like there really is no excuse for people willing and being able to put up with this level of abuse maybe back in the day when we didn't have the internet that could that could stand but nowadays it doesn't run it doesn't really run man but again like i said if you want my further opinion on it let me check out the patreon link will be down below in the descriptions but I'd love to know your opinion on it. What do you think? Do you think Mr. Van der Peppler is, is bugging out? Um, do you think most more labels should just be, what you call it, what are they, what are they called? Should be inclusive of the scene in general, uh, regardless of what they think of it themselves or else? Let me know what you think in the comments down below. What else do we have here? What else do we have here? 
da, 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 da. oh yeah we got this this is pretty decent news and this is courtesy of cnbc um this is um the complete opposite of the whole like rns records this is somebody who doesn't take any hands out so when he's given rejection he goes out and creates his own little lane so this is courtesy of cnbc more than little lvmh buys 50 percent stake in jay-z's um, champagne brand armand de brignac it says the following uh, Moet Hennessy, the wine and spirits division luxury conglomerate LVHM, has um, announced Monday that it purchased 50% stake in rapper Jay Z's champagne brand Armand de Brignac. Financial terms of the deal were not disclosed. You know, when you hear that line, they're talking big money. Um, Jay Z's relationship with Armand de Brignac started in 2006 when the rapper um, bought a 50% stake in the brand and debuted his line or debuted in his Show Me What You Got music video. Oh, that's a preferred one. I didn't know that shit before it officially launched that year he had previously endorsed chris dow and his song before an executive of louis uh rodra whatever you pronounced it made disparaging comments about the role of hip-hop in culture um the rapper whose given name is sean combs uh, sean carter sorry bought the remaining half of our man de brignac in 2014 so that is an epic story and maybe something similar to what's going on with um that guy at rns records if you remember back in the day, Jay-Z was, you know, bang on about, banging on about Crystal, Crystal, Crystal everywhere. Then I guess they were trying to put out the feelers in terms of getting a meeting with these guys. And if I, if I remember correctly, they just weren't getting any word back from Crystal about sitting down for a meeting. And then out of nowhere, this interview comes up where the journalist asks one of the people involved in Crystal about, you know, the association with hip hop and people shout out the brand. And he basically says something along the lines of, oh, we can't help or we can't stop people from buying our products in it. But he, he wasn't very enthusiastic, basically, about the support. And that obviously sent reverberations around hip-hop. And that was during the whole time, there was a whole conversation around um, equity and masters and stuff. So it was a very sensitive topic. And, you know, there's a, obviously that whole, like, um, slavery connotation and, you know, um, just not give, getting your dues and whatever it may be. So instead of complaining, Jay-Z went out there and scanned the market and found this amazing brand, right, that has this, again, luxurious feel, very kind of reminiscent of the things that he was promoting with Crystal, uh, called the Ace of Spades and just completely put his name and brand next to it, remarketed it completely to an urban environment or a kind of, you know, uh, a more hip hop influenced crowd and they lapped it up. It then, became, it then overnight you stopped hearing Chris Dow completely. One person did this, right? And then of course, you know, in 2014 he bought it out completely and he owns it. Um, and it's an incredible story, especially when you figure out. I think I remember reading on Twitter that allegedly it costs like anywhere between thirteen to twenty-two dollars to produce one bottle of um, Ace of Spades, and they sell for like two hundred and twenty-two dollars plus upwards, right? It's up insane markups, um, and he's been able to do that all because he was given, you know, he was told no by the industry, right? The conglomerates told him no. The big established houses said you couldn't get involved. We're not going to give you equity. You don't represent our brand. And we're not going to show you know we're not going to provide your friends with a platform so instead he went out and provided his own that's what i think similarly is happening in dance music less of the kind of telling people how to run their businesses and you just setting up your own again it requires money it requires funds access and shit but it can be done um carter said on cnbc squawk box on monday that he started having conversation about the deal with lvmh in 2019 he said it just started out in a place of respect and built from there quickly mo, Hes mo hennessy ceo philip squaz told cnbc's becky quick that our man de brignac brought new consumers to the champagne category he said what we would bring what we what we could bring to the brand which is already very successful is sheer power by international distribution networks so said the brand which is known by its nickname ace of spades sold more than 500 and 500 000 bottles in 2019 now considering the high retail value or the high retail price markup price tag whatever of it that's a lot of bottles mate um the coronavirus pandemic has hit champagne sales with people having fewer parties and nights out true the industry group said the committee inter interprofessional du vin de champion estimated that champagne sales fell 1.2 billion or 18 billion by the volume last year i'll be interested to see what the sales of champagne are like this year year on year compared to last year especially when you consider we're going to start what going out properly between what the last six months of the year interesting i wonder if it's going to be a bit better just the last six months than it was the entire year because you know people are just in a more jovial and happy um mood in general but yeah i thought that was a great great thing man to see that jay-z went out there and basically did you know put some skin in the game did stop with the talking stopped complaining 
Um, and again, you know, Jay Z has the resources to do these kind of things. But I do think nowadays, like the time for celebrities, the people with actual platforms to go out there and create their own little niche, you know, and provide and kind of create their own platform to do things exactly as they wish to do that lines up more with their brand and what they're about is definitely exists. It just requires a little bit more of, you know, a little bit more of work to kind of get that to work actually. Ba, 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 ba. Next on the list here, what do we have? Okay, just to end it. So to end, we have this. This is courtesy of one of my uh, favorite podcasts that exist out there. This is courtesy of Lex Friedman's podcast, right? And he's speaking to Eric Weinstein. Uh, Weinstein, 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 however you pronounce it. And it's a really good conversation. Um, I think I really recommend you you, uh, you check out Lex Friedman's podcast. Easily one of my favorites at the moment. Probably over probably overtook rogan just because you know things have changed he's obviously gotten older he's got more money in the bank and you know the risk that he used to take prior with his podcasts aren't the same the guests are not the same he's obviously a different person um him kind of banging on about the flipping restrictions and shit and the covid denial stuff it just kind of grates up the wrong you know it just kind of gets a bit great over time but it is what it is i think um still he's you know numero uno in general but in terms of what i go to to listen to you know as soon as i see it released on my you know on my apple podcast um app whatever lex freedom is definitely up there really really good conversation so they're speaking here about cancellations you know it's been going on a lot especially within the little community in la comedians intellectuals um been getting cancelled left and right you know since maybe a few years right it's been happening and eric weinstein makes a really good point um that i sort of resonate with and something that kind of touches close to home because i think a lot of these things again they don't involve me they have nothing to do with me i'm far removed from anything going on in there but part of the reason why i think i have such a visceral reaction to seeing kind of you know people that i've watched week in week out on podcasts and stuff be all chummy chummy and pally pally and the moment something really bad happens to them they tend to kind of you know turn and don't stand up or stick up for their friends is maybe because i don't have many of my own in real life right I'm kind of again a bit of a loner, do things on my own somewhat. So when you're kind of seeing people having this sort of like public displays of friendship, you are oddly enough, it's really cringe, but you're kind of living vicariously through them. So whenever they go through a situation, you're kind of hoping that they are able to kind of um somehow maintain or keep their friendship, even due even, you know, due even when they're going through something really traumatic as getting sort of cancelled and being accused of something really heinous, right? You're just hoping that that could happen because you're wishing that if that was you in that position, that's what you would do. But then when it doesn't happen, it's like, whoa. And then you're led to kind of, you know, grow up and really um figure out that, you know, these guys are grown men they have families to look after they can't just be going out there and defending everybody um, based on the education especially when they have no idea what actually happened but i liked eric weinstein's opinion about when your friends are getting cancelled and how you should really deal with it in real life and i'll play a bit of the clip for you now let me see if i can get a bit here about 120 where is it it should be about there there we go 120 up here
mathematical theorems. If the worst person in the world proves a mathematical theorem like the Unabomber, we can't undo the theorem. Yeah. You know, and, and uh, I think I might have, I think I might mess this one up, didn't I? I think so. Let me see. Yep, I think I might mess that one up. <laughs> I think none of the sound was actually playing there, I'm pretty sure. Oh, that's annoying, isn't it? Okay, let's go back again. I think it should be playing now, but let's go back again. Da, 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 da. Okay, let's go back again. What was I talking about? Friendship and shit. Let's see if I can get a clip up. Okay, cool. It should be from here. So let's go. I'll play this again because I don't think it was actually playing. The sound wasn't on. But this is obviously very quite soon talking about this. Let's see if it plays. Please play. Please play. Okay, let's see. And I, I point out Charles Manson's song, uh, Look at Your Game Girl, is an amazing song. It's a really good song. I don't think it's one of the greatest songs ever. But it happens that he wasn't a no talent. And... You know, I don't know how Hitler was as an artist. It's actually not bad. Okay. We've got to get past this. We've got to get past this idea that we're going to purge ourselves of our badness. And we're just going to, it, this is like, a, I've yeah. likened it to teenage girls and cutting. We're just, all we're doing is destroying ourselves in search of perfection. And the answer is no, we're not perfect. We're flawed. We're screwed up. And we've always been this way. And we're not going to silence everyone who you can point a laser beam at and say, well, that person, look at how bad that person is. If we do that, kiss the whole thing goodbye. We might as well just, let's learn Chinese. But there is an art to having those messy conversations, whether with, with Alex or anybody else. Okay, it's, let's talk about Alex. Yeah, There's particular stuff that Alex does that's absolutely nauseating. And there's other stuff that he's doing that's funny. The methodology of, of the way he carries. And like, sometimes he's talking about the truth. And sometimes he's talking about a conspiracy theory. His variance is incredibly high. Yeah. The right way to approach Alex Jones or James O'Keefe or the National Enquirer or anything you don't like is to say, great, go long short. What's that mean? Well, if you invest in a mutual fund, all the stocks in the mutual fund are held long. Mm -hmm. But if you invest in a hedge fund, you do something called relative value trade. It's like, well, are you long tech or short tech? Well, actually, I'm long Microsoft and I'm short Google. Why is that? Oh, because I believe Google got way too much attention. I don't think that's the right clip. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. I don't think that's the right clip. He speaks about people getting cancelled. I think I've got the wrong timestamps. I'm pretty sure. Oh, man. I'm pretty sure I've got the wrong timestamps here. Something about being cancelled. Where is it? Oh, Jesus Christ. Cancel culture. Was it here? Cancel culture. Or was it eight? Did I get it? Maybe I got it wrong. I think it might have been 18. Let's see if it's this one. I don't treat these things like, you know, I had a conversation where Kevin Spacey was at the dinner table when I came down from a hotel room and I had a very long conversation with Kevin Spacey. I will not detail because I don't do that uh, as to what we discussed. But we talked very specifically about him being canceled. And I don't think that the world has heard that story in part because there is a, a very strong sense that he has to be outgrouped. And as a result, you know, I mean, do we want, do, do we want to disavow the space program because it touched Werner von Braun? Do we want to disavow quantum mechanics because Pascal Jordan and Werner Heisenberg passed through it? Is Aaron Fest's theorem false because he murdered his child? No. I mean, at what point do we recognize that we are the problem? Humans are humans. And there is no perfect, there, there is no perfect group of people, even all of the most oppressed people, the supposed victims of the world who we now have fetishized into thinking that they're all oracles because their lived experience informs us and their pain is more salient than everyone else's pain. Those people aren't necessarily great people. You yeah. know, it's, it's like none, none of us. We so, can't we can't do this in this fashion. So when we sit down to have a conversation across the table from somebody, you should be willing to like you should not have NPR in your mind. You should be willing to take the full risk and to see the good in the person without with limited information and to do your best to understand that person. 
everybody is entitled to a hypocrisy budget. I don't believe this is of institutions. Yeah. Okay. Everybody is entitled to a certain amount of. This is still the wrong one. It's the wrong one. <laughs> It is the wrong one. It's the wrong one. It really is. I don't know. I'll I'll, I'll find the clip again and play it probably, but I don't think that's the right clip to play. But yeah, check out Lex Friedman's podcast anyway, regardless. Um, Eric Weinstein was on the episode number 163. Easily one of my favorites. Um, great clip there. Him talking about some things that I necessarily didn't want to talk about, but hey, we are where we are. Anyways, that is an hour of the show. Thanks both for tuning in to Excellent English Show episode number 436 or 437 on them. Regardless of what it is, um, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. If you listen via the podcast app, please give me a five star review, download the show, and share it with your friends. And as per usual, links via the Patreon and all that are in the description down below too. So make sure you click on that, get involved, don't delay. And I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Take care, be safe, peace.